Boldwood Presents Warrior and Protector Written by Peter Gibbons And read by Sean Barrett The moral right of the author has been asserted This performance is owned by Boldwood Beert North Matalod Bord Hafenod Wandawakna Aisk Wardum Malda Yira and Anrad Ageaf him Answar Ki hist thu salida what this folk saith. Ye will art yow to gafol garas silan, art rin ord an elder's word. Beard North made a speech, raised his shield, waved his slender ash spear, spoke in words, angry and resolute, gave him back an answer. Do you hear, seafarer, what these people say? They are willing to give you spears as tribute, deadly point and tested swords. An excerpt from the Battle of Malden, an Anglo-Saxon poem written to celebrate the battle fought at Malden in 991 A.D. Prologue, 989 A.D. The Drakkar warship sliced through an iron-gray sea. Its clinker-built timbers flexed with the rise and fall of the white-tipped waves, and the ship's prow beast snarled and cut its way across the whale road towards the Saxon coastline, as sleek and swift as an eagle diving for its prey. Skarda Wartooth heaved on the tiller, feeling the strength and power of the sea god Njorth in the resistance beneath his hand. He tossed his head back, enjoying the fresh chill of icy sea spray on his face as the wind whipped his long hair behind him like the pelt of a wild beast. He checked to his port, where two similar drakars kept pace with him, crashing and slicing through the surging sea, each one filled with four score of warriors. Skarda's warships darted towards the lands of the Saxons, where a gap showed in the shadow-shrouded promontory of its hills and cliffs. There, the country opened up into a wide estuary, where a river yawned its mouth open to pour its waters into the wide sea. Skarda steered for that estuary and the river beyond, the watery roadway which would allow him to sail his shallow-drafted warships along its meandering course and deep into the heart of Saxon Britain. He thought this part of the island of Britain was the old kingdom of East Anglia, which was now part of the larger kingdom of Wessex and nascent kingdom of the English. But it didn't matter if it was East Anglia or Wessex. Skarda just wanted to kill Saxons. He reached for the small iron spear amulet at his neck and touched the metal for luck. Most men worshipped Thor, Njord, or Tyr. Odin wanted them to fight. Thor and Tyr welcomed the blood and sacrificed Skarda and his men would offer up to their glory. Our lord, Olaf Tryggvason, wants us to cut a swathe of war and fear across Saxon lands, Skarda shouted to his men. Our people, my own kin, were butchered by the Saxons. Let them feel our fury now. Let them feel the wrath of the blood feud. Death to the Saxons! He pulled his axe free of the loop of his belt and held the blade aloft. His men cheered wildly and stomped their feet on the hull of his warship, the rhythmic pounding creating stirring war music. Skarda's lord, Olaf Tryggvason, was striking at the same time further along the Saxon coast. Olaf had brought twenty warships to attack the Saxons, filled with warriors baying for war and glory. Skarda could smell the famously rich earth of Saxon farmland as they closed in on the coastline. He could smell victory and vengeance on the wind. Skarda closed his eyes and remembered his aunt and uncle's faces. In the north the Saxons had burned his own father's sister and her husband alive, following the defeat of Eric Bloodaxe and his loss of the Kingdom of York to the Saxons. So, Skarda was here now, filled with war fury and ready to bring the blood feud to all Saxons. They would feel the pain and suffering of his own kin, and Skarda would burnish his reputation brightly with the blood and bones of Saxon warriors. The coastline drew close, cliffs rising high, topped by the famed lush greenery of Saxon Britain. Skarda saw riders there, small and skittish on the hillside, and he grinned to himself. 
Riders on the coast, he said to Ulf Ketil. Let's find the nearest beach and go ashore. Hopefully they have brought their best warriors. The Esturian river beyond with the key to cutting deep into the countryside, but the chance to fight and kill Saxons on the beach was too good to refuse. His men had braved the dangers of the whale road to reach these shores, and he saw a chance to color their blades with Saxon blood. Ulf Ketil bellowed the orders to the crew, and the warship banked towards the lands of the Saxons. Skarda turned and watched with satisfaction as his other warships made the same maneuver, making a sweep and following his lead like birds dipping and swooping as one flock in the sky. The wind whipped in the sails, and he felt the power of the sea beneath his hand again as his calloused palm gripped the tiller. It warmed his heart. The gods were with him. Njort gave him calm seas, and he knew Odin itched for blood and souls just as much as he did. The golden sands of a Saxon beach rose into view beyond the rise and fall of the swell. Skarda raced towards it, watching the enemy horsemen pick their way down the hillside, spears and helmets glinting in the early spring sun. Ulf Ketil had the sail lowered, and the men withdrew the timber plugs from the holes along the ship's side and made ready the long oars, removing them from their deck hooks and sliding them into place. Flatnose clashed his axe on a shield to beat time, and the oarsmen gave a clipped roar at each long pull. The ship surged towards the beach. Skarda could see men gathered there, a line of Saxon shields painted bright with the sigil of their lord, making ready to meet Skarda and his warriors. His heart quickened in his chest. All his life he had trained to fight. He was born to the blade and devoted to Odin, all father. His chance to avenge his slaughtered uncle and aunt and burnish his own reputation was so close he could smell it above the salt of the sea and the acrid sweat of his men. The warship crunched onto a shelf of shale at the edge of the Saxon beach. Ulf Ketil threw the anchor stone over the side and its seal hide rope snapped taut. Skarda put one hand on the sheer streak and leapt over the side and into the sea. The icy cold bit at his chest, and for a brief horrifying moment panic flooded his senses as his head dipped beneath the water. He wore a mail coat and heavy war gear. If the water were deeper than head height, he would drown before he could strike a blow in anger. But he pushed with his feet, and his head burst through the surface. Skarda roared his defiance at the Saxon sea. The men aboard his ship cheered, and of Ketil tossed Skarda his shield. Skarda pumped his legs hard to push through the seized resistance as quickly as possible, the weight of his soaked clothes, armor, and weapons cumbersome. He stumbled as the tide tried to drag him back into its clawing embrace. He emerged from the water amidst a line of his men, vicious, hungry killers all, and he laughed at the timid Saxons. They should have killed him as he came stumbling from the water, but they waited on the beach behind a line of shields. Even their horsemen had dismounted to join the shield wall, instead of riding Skarda and his men down before they could reach it. The Saxons hesitated, and they were afraid, and now they would die. Part One Reeve Chapter One Masterless warriors occupied Offa's crag, a band of that lost caste of men cursed to drift across the country as outlaws and sell swords. Such men were warriors spat out by the constant petty feuds and cattle disputes which plagued the borderlands between the Saxon shires and the remnants of the old Danelaw. The Danelaw had been destroyed by the death of Eric Bloodaxe thirty-five years earlier, bringing an end to Viking rule in the Saxon north. But Danes were still as thick on the land as fleas on a grizzled dog. The Viking Danes had lived in the Danelaw for over a hundred years, descendants of the great heathen army brought howling to Saxon shores by Ivar the Boneless and his brothers, all sons of Ragnar Luthbrook, in their savage attack on Northumbria, East Anglia, and Mercia. Fear North pressed his right knee into his horse's flank, guiding her around a briar bright with purple thistles. She snorted and picked her way around the bush, taking a path across softer ferns and fallen pines. The mare was small and slow, too old to be riding up to the summit of the high valley which rose steeply from the glistening waters of the river Mersey. 
Office Crag sat high and dark in Cheshire, a newly created shire nestled in the borderlands between Northumbria, Mercia, and Gwynedd. Beornorth saw the crag through a break in the pine trees ahead, its grey stone flecked with white rock jutting and prominent against the brown and green hue of the hillside. In the old days, they had said the crag was the lair of a mountain Eotun, a monster who would sneak out of his high fastness in the night to terrorize the farm and village folk. The only monsters up there now were the masterless men, brutal, desperate warriors looking for silver, food, women, and ale. Beornorth did not know how many of the brigands there were, just that armed men had ransacked farms and stolen cattle, and that a shepherd had seen them marching for Office Crag. They were a ragged band of thieves and killers, and it was Beornorth's responsibility to bring them to justice. A masterless man is a cursed thing, an outlaw who can be killed on sight, a warrior not attached to a lord, a roaming soldier not sworn to serve a thane, or an elderman, but carrying the strength of his arm and his blades to wherever there is trouble. There was always fighting in the north, especially around the borderlands between shires, and lords always needed warriors. Masterless men without pay plagued Saxon lands, roaming and stealing, looting and killing, until they found trouble to profit from, or a lord to pay them to fight. Go up there, confront them, we demand justice, the farmers of Knotsford had said, wagging their thick fingers at Beornoth, their ruddy faces frowning and twisted with anger. There could be three men up there on the crag, armed with knives and clubs, or ten veteran warriors armed with spears and shields. The farmers didn't care how many men there were, or that Beornoth was just one man. Beornoth was the reeve, and it was his duty to bring down justice upon the criminals and protect the farms, known as hides, within his hideage. He reached for the skin of ale at the rear of his saddle and grimaced as the effort of leaning stretched his bloated gut. Beornoth took a pull at the ale, and then another, tipping the skin upright to drain the last bitter dregs. He belched and cursed, throwing the empty skin into the undergrowth. He didn't care if there were three men or ten men. Either way, the bastards were going to meet his steel on Offa's crag. His horse reached the edge of the pine forest, and Beornorth emerged onto the hillside, a chill wind blowing against his face and stinging his ears. He pulled his threadbare woolen cloak about his shoulders. He had kept to the woodland during his ascent of the hills to keep hidden from the view of the crag summit, even though that approach made the journey longer. Beornorth moved the spear from his left hand to his right. The shaft was smooth from use, and he thought he must wrap the thing for grip once he returned to town. If they did not kill him on Offa's crag, he could hear men's voices, the sound of laughter and chatter travelling on the wind. Those sounds told of men lolling and comfortable in their safety, bellies no doubt full of stolen beef and hands warming at a fire telling each other old war stories and laughing at the weak farmers they had robbed, unaware that the farmers had come for the local reeve, Beornoth, to ask him for justice. He slid off the horse's back, and she curled her lip at him, snorting a gush of foul breath into his face. Beornoth produced an ale belch and blew its foulness at the horse in return. He would leave the poor nag here. Riding her up onto the crag would just make the masterless men laugh. Beornoth was too big to ride her. His legs jutted out around the sides of her flanks, and she was not a war horse. If he still had his old horse, he would have ridden the brute up the hillside and charged them. He wondered where he was now, old Beorgan. That was a horse, a beautiful, big, brave animal, trained for war. Beorgan would snap his teeth at enemy faces and crush men with his heavy hooves, a horse fit for a warlord. Beornoth rested the spear against his nag's flank and tightened the straps of his breastplate. It was just a chest and belly covering of hard-baked leather, not proper armor, not like a Birney mail coat, but it still offered some protection against a spear or knife thrust. He untied the dented and misshapen half-helm from the saddle and pushed it onto his head. It was tight and the rim dug into his forehead, 
so he raised his eyebrows several times to loosen the fit. It was a terrible helmet, and he had no leather liner to sit beneath it for comfort, but it was better than no helmet at all. Bear North's skull had been cracked a few times over the years, and a blow to the head could drop a man, leaving him vulnerable and open to a death blow. He reached for his sword hilt, a reflex action built over a lifetime of war and practice for war, but his hand only grasped at thin air. Bear North sighed. The blade was not there at his belt, and had not been for years. His fingers yearned for it, for the comfort of the leather-wrapped grip, to feel the balance in the hilt of the long blade, and to raise her to his lips so he could kiss the iron cross inlaid into the crosspiece. A sword was not just a weapon. It was a warning to an enemy. It said that the wielder was a wealthy warrior made rich through war skill and the blood of his enemies. It warned men that the wielder was a killer and they should be wary of him. A sword was an expensive weapon reserved for the most fearsome and skilled of warriors and for noblemen and kings. It was a weapon only the finest smiths could craft. Bernorth spat into the bracken at his feet. The sword was gone, along with so much else. Instead, he pulled a war axe from its leather sheath on the mare's saddle. The blade was pitted with rust, and its haft was as worn by use as the spear shaft. Bernorth took the spear in his right hand, hefted the axe in his left, and began the trudge up the hillside towards Offa's crag. The ground was heavy, covered in a dew, resting there since morning, and not yet burned off by the sun, so that after a few paces it soaked his boots through to his feet. He could hear the warriors talking as he grew closer, one high-pitched voice with a cackling laugh, another deep and rumbling. In the old days, Beornoth would have carried his war shield on his back, an iron boss surrounded by linden wood planking and secured with an iron rim. Now he owned only a rusty axe and a worn-out spear, but it would still be enough. He reached the base of the crag, with the stone emerged from the ground like a magnificent beast's claw grasping at the hillside, so the monster beneath the earth could haul itself from the world beneath to terrorize the world of men. The world of men was not much better than the underworld. Beornoth had seen monsters stalking the world in defiance of the laws of God and Christ. Monsters disguised as men, burning, raping, killing, and drenched in the blood of women and children. He held on to that thought, and his memories conjuring terrible images to the forefront of his mind. Memories of fifteen summers as a warrior, and the dark pain of his own terrible loss. Normally he pushed such images away to a place where they could only haunt his dreams in the bleakness of night and sleep. But he needed them now. He told himself that the masterless men beyond the crag were the perpetrators of those horrific acts, of the burned, twisted bodies of small children. He told himself these men were the ones who had come to his land, back in the old days, and taken everything from him. Beornoth was breathing heavily, though the march up the hillside was gentle even for his aging bones. It was the rage heaving at his chest, stretching at the cold leather breastplate. His thick and rugged knuckles were white with tension on axe and spear, knuckles smashed and healed countless times down the years. Beornoth clenched his jaw, his tongue slipping in and out of the missing teeth at the side of his face, but an arrow had once shot him in the mouth, ripping his face open. He rolled his heavy shoulders to loosen the thick, corded muscle. Strength built over a lifetime of weapon work, sword work, axe work, murder, battle, and practice. He leapt up onto the crag and onto its top. Below him, six men sat around a crackling fire, eating freshly roasting beef and sharing skins of ale. Six bearded faces stared up at Beornoth, and they saw a big man armed with an axe and spear. The hillside was still. The only sounds were the crackling of their campfire and the whistle of the wind. Beornoth broke that silence with a roar, the bellow of a man who has seen murdered children and hurt women, the challenge of a man who has trained his whole life to fight and kill. At that moment, Beornoth projected the blame for all the atrocities and horror he had witnessed in his life onto those six men, and hate raged inside his belly like the flames of hell. Beornoth leapt from the crag and landed amongst them. 
He bent his knees to cushion the landing and stabbed the spear point into a bald man's eye, using the strength in his right arm to drive the spear point deep into the warrior's face until it met resistance at the back of his skull. He swung his axe backhand with his left hand, so it chopped with a wet slap into the side of another man's head. Blood sprayed over the warriors around that man, and he toppled, quivering to the earth, his head a mass of red and black gore. Beornoth snarled and took a step forward to kick the flaming logs of the campfire onto two men opposite him. Sparks and cinder filled the air around the crag, and a warrior's greasy beard and hair caught fire. That man screamed like the devil and rolled onto the grass, clutching at his burning face and eyes. Three unwounded men leapt to their feet. One narrowly avoided the flaming logs Beornoth had kicked at him, and rose with a wicked bladed sax in his hand. He was an enormous man, bigger even than Beornoth, and with a scarred face twisted by anger and surprise. The smell of burning hair and flesh filled Beornoth's nose, and his ears rang with the mewing of dying warriors. He realized he was shouting incoherently, spittle flying from his mouth to fleck his beard, visions of massacred women and children still flashing before his eyes. He tugged on the axe haft, but it had lodged deep in the head of the dead warrior, so he let it go and grabbed his spear shaft in both hands and ripped it free of his victim's skull. The man closest to him ran, so Beornoth kicked at his heels, and that man tumbled to the ground, screaming as he landed and rolled in the blood of his dead comrade. The big man charged at Beornoth, so he cracked him across the nose with the shaft of his spear and kneed the warrior in the groin. Beornoth spun around the big man's creased-over torso to lunge his spear point into the belly of the final warrior who was coming at him armed with a spear of his own. Beornoth twisted his spear in that last attacker's guts and ripped it sideways and upwards so the blue coils of the warrior's inside sloughed into the remnants of the fire, where they hissed as they hit the hot orange center of the flames. The big man wrapped his arms around Beornoth's waist and tried to drive him backwards. Beornoth felt a hard, dull punch in his lower back, so he let go of his spear and hooked his foot around the big man's ankle and threw him over his hip. The big man thudded into the earth, and Beornoth stamped on his face hard, and then stamped on him again. Beornoth's chest heaved with the exertion, and a bead of sweat rolled down the side of his forehead and into his beard. The rage subsided. Its void filled quickly with tiredness. Beornoth coughed and removed his ill-fitting half-helm and let it fall to the ground. He looked at the carnage, groaning at an ache in his left shoulder blade and a throbbing in his right knee, old wounds sending him an echo of pain down the years. He wondered, if the farmers were to see the wounded and dying on the crag, would they feel he had brought them justice? A whimpering sound snapped Beornoth from his thoughts. The man he had tripped was crawling on all fours, like a pig trying to escape the butcher. Beornoth stepped over the big, unconscious man, and bent to pick up the haft of his axe where it protruded from the head of the dead warrior. He put his foot on that corpse's chest and yanked it free, the blade making a sucking sound as it tore free of brain and skull. He rested the axe on his shoulder and picked his way amongst the dead and dying, moving to the crawling man. Please, please, Lord, don't kill me, said the warrior, spinning to lie on his back and raising his hands. I am not a lord, said Beornoth. Not any more, anyway. You don't need to kill me, said the man, blubbering. Tears rolled down his cheeks, tracing lines across the filth of his face. A bubble of snot formed in one of his nostrils. I'll go away. I'll never come back. We didn't mean to take the cows, or— Beornoth grunted as he brought the axe down over his shoulder, both hands on the haft for maximum force, and slammed the blade into the man's chest. Bones crunched, and a spurt of dark blood sprayed from the man's mouth as he died mid-sentence. Beornoth turned and retrieved his spear, and used it to cut the throat of the man with the burned face, who lay silently quivering amongst a pile of ferns. Five masterless men were dead, leaving one survivor. Beornoth looked up at the shifting, dark sky. Clouds broiled, and he thought it might rain before nightfall. Below him the valley spread out in a patchwork of brown farmland, golden crop fields, and bronze-topped woodland. Down there, people worked and lived their lives, peasants and serfs, honest people raising children and trying to find happiness amongst life's dull drudgery. They needed Beornoth. He protected them from the wolves. His savagery and war skill allowed them to sleep in peace.
to laugh with their children and hold each other close on dark, cold nights. He felt no pity for the men he had killed. Once a man had made the choice to take up arms, then he risked pain and death, and Veanorth had brought both to Offa's crag. When the big man woke, Veanorth would make him gather anything of value. He would tie the bastard to his horse and drag him down into the villages. The farmers would want to know that justice was delivered before they paid Veanorth, and then he would find a drink to dull the pain. The pain that covered Veanorth with a shroud of heavy sadness. Memories of a life lost. Of what was and could have been, but could never be again. Chapter Two Veanorth chewed on a piece of freshly roasted beef torn from a chunk of meat he had rescued from the campfire at the crag. The juices ran into his beard, and he groaned in appreciation of the deep, earthy taste. He went to take another delicious bite when his nag jerked beneath him, and the meat flew from his hand to land amongst the nettles and brush. Veanorth cursed and twisted in the saddle. The big man was lying face down in the dirt, the rope tying him to the saddle taut and his arms stretched upwards from the ground, as though he were prostrating himself in prayer. His falling had caused the horse to falter, and Beanorth sighed with disappointment. Get up, you lazy bastard, he growled. The man didn't move. Beanorth sighed again and lurched from the saddle. He landed heavily on the ground, jarring his aching knee. He thought about picking up the piece of fallen beef, but it was caked in dust and soil, surrounded by stinging nettles, and his horse was nudging her wet nose at it. He walked to the big man and kicked him in the ribs. The masterless man groaned, but didn't get up. Beanorth clenched his teeth and shook his head. He tucked his boot under the man's shoulder and flipped him onto his side, the sack on his back clanking as its iron content shifted position. His belly and thighs were filthy with the dirt and muck of the hillside and forest floor, his whole torso streaked with red blood and long weeping grazes, which was no surprise to Beanorth because he had dragged the man naked behind his horse for most of the afternoon, with a bundled cloak strapped to his back. The cloak was filled with weapons and anything of value Beanorth had stripped from the dead at the crag. The big man's eyes opened into slits, and he spat dirt and grass from his mouth. He looked at Beanorth from the corners of his eyes, without turning his head. Either get up and walk, or I'll cut your stinking throat and leave you here for the animals said Beanorth. What a... what a hill? The big man said, his voice rasping and little more than a whisper. There's no hill for dead men. Get up, brigand. I won't say it again. But a warrior, lord? You are no warrior. You are a masterless, sell-sword bastard. Beanorth reached to his back and rasped the handle of the sacks he had stripped from the big man. It was a fine weapon, well made and sheathed in a beautifully patterned scabbard which hung from the rear of his belt by two thongs. I am a warrior. I fought at Prestonbrook in the front ranks. There North let go of his blade. He crouched, coming closer to the man and wincing at the pain in his knee as he did so. Don't lie to me. I was at Prestonbrook. I don't lie, Lord. I was with Quichelm's men. He was the thane in Fernbridge. Very well. If you were there, tell me. Why did the Danes lose that day? A big brute of a man drove a wedge of our warriors into their lines and broke them. Then our horsemen charged from the flank and rolled them up, said the big man and coughed up a goblet of dusty phlegm into the dirt. Beanorth nodded and scratched at his beard. The man spoke the truth. Beanorth knew, because he was the man who had led that wedge through the Viking shield wall. A formidable line of overlapped shields, held firm by spear and sword. The Danes, long-haired, tattooed warriors, snarled and bayed, desperate to shove their sharp blades into his flesh and to spill his blood. A grim day, said Beanorth. He reached around to his back and took a small skin of water from where it hung over his shoulder. He handed it to the big man who sucked it down in great gulps and nodded his thanks. 
Beanoth stood and felt a throbbing in his side. He checked it with his palm, and it came away bloody. The big man had cut him when they had grappled at the crag. He had felt a blow there at the time, but hadn't realized it was a blade. So many wounds over the years, it was hard to tell punch from stab sometimes. Beanoth had often suffered a dull thud in the heat and frenzy of battle, and not realized the severity of the wound until afterwards. He had suffered a spear wound in his thigh that day at Preston Brook, and an axe haft had cracked him across the face, swelling his cheekbone. So many fights down over the years, too many cuts and rends in his flesh to remember. They came back to him as flashes of pain, of days lying in bed or in fields, bleeding and sweating with fever. Often such memories were accompanied by visions of lost friends, the ones who had not been as lucky as he. Those visions would plague Beanoth's nights as vivid dreams. An old mate from the shield wall, carved open by an unforgiving enemy, or a boyhood friend seeping his lifeblood into a shadowed battlefield. Wolf here is my name, the big man said. Beanoth ignored him and took the water skin back. He made sure the knotted cloak was secure on Wolf Hera's back. He could sell the weapons in town, and the profits would keep him in ale, at least for a while. The big man heaved himself to standing, grunting under the weight of the sack, and held up his tied wrists to Beanoth, looking from the rope to Beanoth and back again. Please, Lord, for a veteran fallen on hard times. Beanoth mounted his nag and stroked her ear, and nudged her on towards the village. The rope behind him snapped taut, yanking Wolf Hera forwards. Don't fall again, Beanoth growled at him without looking back. The village of Knotsford was a collection of wattle buildings, topped by thatch and various stages of repair, from newly woven thatch shining bright gold under the afternoon sun, to deep grey mottled rotting thatch, which was a haven for rats and lice. Knotsford was a village centred on a ford crossing a wide river which cut through the valley basin. The village boasted a blacksmith, a merchant, a tavern, and a meeting hall. It served as the central gathering place for the surrounding farms in the valley. Beanoth rode his mare into the central square, which was little more than a patch of ground trodden by countless horses and wagons to impacted mud in between two lines of buildings. At the center of the square was a raised timber platform used for announcements and such. The clip-clop of his mare on the hard-packed earth road into the village caused curious faces to emerge from doorways and bodies slunk from lanes and alleys, curious to see who had arrived in their village. Beanoth ignored them. He was aware of bearded faces staring at him, whispering, and of local women pointing and cackling at Wolf Hera's nakedness. It was here at Knutsford where the farmers had appealed to Beanoth to bring justice to the masterless men who had attacked farms in the valley. And now he brought the proof of that justice for payment. He looked across at the tavern, a wide building with black timber structural beams showing through the wattle walls and small shuttered windows. He licked his lips, thirsty for the ale he planned to sup once they paid him. Enough ale to dull his memories, enough to send him into a dreamless, drunken sleep. The reavers returned! A shout went up from across the square, and three men approached, striding confidently with thumbs tucked in wide belts. I told you he would punish them, didn't I? said a round-faced man with curly red hair. You did, Jen Wolf, I'll give you that, said another. This man was short and rotund with a black beard and a bald head. Beanoth slid from his horse and untied the rope from the saddle. The wound at his back stretched and Beanoth grunted at the pain. Wolf Hera dropped to his knees in the mud and the metal-filled cloak on his back clanked. Is this one of them? said the short man. Beanoth untied the cloak from Wolf Hera's back and dropped it at the feet of Chen Wolf, the merchant. It opened to reveal a collection of daggers a short antler-handled sax, a spearhead, and two rusting cloak pins. Chen Wolf grinned and itched at his belly. Must have been half a dozen of them, judging by these weapons, he said, and whistled. And you on your own, Bale? How much for all of it? asked Beanoth. 
Except this. He bent and picked up the sax. It was a fine weapon, and the antler handle made a comfortable grip. Chen Wolf sucked at his teeth and shook his head. Half a pound of silver? Ben North sighed and pointed at Wolf Hera. I could let him go. Let him loose in the square. He'd have your guts opened in a heartbeat and your women carried off before nightfall. Pay the man, Chen Wolf, said the third man, a broad-shouldered blacksmith. There's good iron there. All right, all right. One pound of silver, said Chen Wolf. Beornoth nodded and dragged Wolf Hera to the central platform and tied him there. Don't escape. I'll just ride you down and kill you. Wolf Hera gave a snort of laughter. These book savages will kill me anyway. Better to die well, I reckon. He was right, and Beornoth knew it. The villagers would call the farmers in from the hides around the valley, and they would hang Wolf Hera in the square for all to gawp at him as he choked and dangled on the rope. It was no way for a warrior to die, especially one who had bled for his people and fought the fearsome Danes at Preston Brook. If any man knew how it felt to fall on hard times, it was Beornoth. Wolf Hera had lost his way somewhere in his life. Perhaps his lord had died in battle with an enemy, forcing Wolf Hera to flee. Perhaps a son had inherited from his father and looked upon Wolf Hera with ill favour. There were a multitude of reasons for a warrior to lose his master, his ring-giver, and become an outlaw, a man living outside of the structure of Saxon life. Chen Wolf held out a small leather purse. Beornoth took it, and the jangle of the hacked-up pieces of silver within made his stomach rumble with the promise of food, and his mouth water at the prospect of ale. A rumbling sound coming from the west interrupted his reverie, like thunder rolling down the valley before a violent storm. Horsemen, said the blacksmith. The three villagers all looked to Beornoth. He shrugged, not having any idea who was approaching. Just in case, Beornoth went to his mare and pulled his axe free of its sheath and tucked it into his belt, and he grabbed his spear. He turned to stand in the center of the square. The sound of thunder grew louder, and Beornoth felt its thrum beneath his boots. A troop of ten horsemen cantered around the bend in the village main street and reined in before the central platform, their mounts snorting and throwing up clods of hardened earth. One man wore a shining helmet, chased with fur, and a thick wool cloak with a stole of fox fur at his neck. He had a sword strapped to his waist, and a war shield hung from the saddle of his monstrous war horse. Beornoth straightened his back. He knew the man. The villagers bowed their heads to the warrior and his men. Beornoth did not. Beornoth! shouted the richly dressed warrior, his voice deep and full. Elderman Athelhelm, said Beornoth, still at blade work. Always, lord. Who is this? said Athelhelm, pointing at Wolf Hera. Brigand! A group of masterless men were up on office drag, up to no good, attacked a few farms. So they sent you up there. They did, Lord. What is your place here, Beornoth? I mean, you are no longer a thane, of course. The elder man cleared his throat as he muttered the last words and straightened himself in the saddle. Beornoth scratched at his beard. Athelhelm knew well that Beornoth was not a thane any more. He knew because Athelhelm was the man who had taken that rank away from him. Beornoth did not hate him for it. He had left the elder man with little choice. He's the reef of this hidage, said Chenwolf, head still bowed, but looking up at the elder man, his tongue flicking nervously at his lips. An elder man ranked below only the king and Athelhelm was the lord of vast swathes of land in the newly created shire of Cheshire. The great Saxon lords had forged Cheshire after the death of Eric Bloodaxe from what was the western kingdom of York and the land south of the river Mersey touching the borders of Mercia. A lowly man like Chenwulf, without rank, might only get to address a mighty lord such as Athelhelm once in his life, if he was lucky. Chenwulf was not about to allow that opportunity to slip by. How many hides in this hidage? asked Athelhelm, 
Ten hides, Lord. Good farms, all of them. Athelhelm looked at Beornoth, and for a moment Beornoth thought he saw a look of sadness pass across the elderman's face. Athelhelm had fought the Danes for as long as Beornoth, which was to say that he had been fighting from the time he was old enough to hold a sword steady. The elder man would remember Beornoth as he was, in the old days. And Beornoth saw pity written across Athelhelm's face. Beornoth sniffed and met his gaze. He remembered himself as Athelhelm would remember him, garbed in a fine chain-mail birnie, helmet gleaming and a long cloak streaming behind him as he galloped along on a war-horse, bright sword drawn and ready to strike. Beornoth had been a lord of war, a thane, and men had called him lord in those days long ago. How many masterless men were up there? A few, Beornoth shrugged. That means two, said a young warrior, tall and slim, who sat astride a beautiful grey mare. The surrounding warriors sniggered. The young warrior had golden hair tied back with a strip of woven leather, and he wore a beony mail coat polished to a burnished shine. There were six, my lords, said Chenwolf, pushing his shoulders back and glancing at Beornoth. There were six, and Beornoth went up alone. Only the prisoner here lives. Six? asked the young man. They must have been asleep, or as drunk as beggars, on free mead. Some of the mounted warriors laughed again. Beornoth recognized two of the older men, grizzled warriors. They did not laugh at the jest. Only the younger warriors chuckled along. Old Beornoth, against six men, eh? said the elder man, grinning. They stood no chance. Beornoth here was a thane in the days when the Danes were still thick across the old kingdom of York. He rode with me as we cleared them out in the years following the death of Bloodaxe. He's the man we are here to see. Arthelhelm got down from his warhorse amid much creaking of leather and loud groaning. Beornoth had indeed ridden for years as a young man with Athelhelm, scouring the land of the fearsome Danish outlaws. Eric Bloodaxe was their last king in York, and he had died in the time of Beornoth's father, but the fallout from the great Viking king's death had continued for decades. Walk with me, Beornoth, he said, striding through the mud of the village square. They walked together until out of earshot of the villagers and the elderman's retainers. A long way from the old days, said Athelhelm, looking around the drab squalor of the village. Beornoth said nothing. Memories of his old hall, with its golden thatch, clawed their way up from the depths of his mind. Then a vision of his wife at the hall doors, the sun shining in her hair, and the sound of his children playing rang in his head. Terrible business, what happened to you and yours, Athelhelm continued. Yes, Lord. Still, a man like you is bred for the blade, and there's always need for killers to protect the sheep. Yes, Lord. They are back, Beo. Who, Lord? Who else? The Vikings. They're raiding along the south and east coast in large numbers. Fishermen report sightings of their cursed dragon boats. Fearsome men and warriors all. So they're in Essex and Wessex, then. They must have a new leader? Some young wolf called Olaf Trygvason, from the far north, I hear. He will be a king one day, and you know as well as I do that to be a king amongst the Northmen, a man must be savage, cunning, and have a great reputation. With a name like that, he sounds more like a Norseman than a Dane. At least they are down south this time, Lord, away from your lands. Could be a Norseman. They are down south, but the king has ordered me and the rest of the king's thanes in all the shires to bring warriors south to help fight the enemy. How many were right, Lord? All of my thanes and most of my retainers. Not yet, though. I have work to finish here in the north first. So I will send a few men ahead. Good men. Men who know how to kill Danes. Or Norsemen. Athelhelm stopped and put a gloved hand on Beornoth's shoulder. I want you to go, Beo. Take some of my men and my bastard son with you. 
kill some bloody Vikings and teach my bastard how to fight. Beornoth looked into the elderman's roomy eyes. Athelhelm had been present in the maelstrom of Beornoth's life for as long as he could remember. He had been a good lord, but also the man who had stripped everything from Beornoth in the dark days. He did not blame him for that, though. It was his duty as elderman. If you go, Beornoth, and you fight well, when you return, I will give you back a heriot with weapons, a home, and all the rights which go with it. The breath caught in Beornoth's chest. So, kill some Vikings, and all Athelhelm has taken away he would restore? The inheritance and honor of Beornoth's family, going back to the time when his ancestors first came to the shores of Britain to win themselves a kingdom, the elder man would give back to him? His shame washed away with the blood of Viking raiders. Does Theodred still hold my heriot? He does. Your mail, your sword, your helmet, your war horse, and your old lands, all the things which belonged to your father before you. Does he go south to kill Vikings? Not yet, but he will. And you would take from him all that you took from me? My father's heriot, my family's weapons and lands? No, Beo, but fight. Do what you do best, and I will grant you a new heriot, new lands and weapons. Then I cannot go, my lord. My place is here as Reeve. You command Thanes, and a Thanes' purpose is to fight for his lord and fulfill his oath. You grant the heriot, because the man who holds it must bring the granted weapons. His horse, and the warriors from the lands he holds, to fight for his elderman and for the king. So, Theodred can march south to mind your son, and kill the sea wolves. Chapter 3 Turns out the stories about this man were fanciful horseshit, after all. Beornoth, the brutal warrior, champion of the battle at Preston Brook, said the golden-haired warrior with a smirk, his horse snorting and scraping at the earth. This reeve is afraid of the Vikings. We will go, the real warrior's father. We shall teach these damned heathens a lesson. Beornoth has killed more Danes than you have had hot meals said the elder man, and shot a frown at Beornoth. I can't force you, and you should be careful turning down my offer with your prideful tongue. I am an elder man, and I can force you if I choose. Don't let pride impede a chance to redeem yourself. The people down south need your sword. These are raiding Vikings, hungry for war. They come with vengeance in their hearts for the death of Eric Bloodaxe and the many Dane and Norse farmers killed in the purges that followed. These men who sail to our shores are burners, killers, rapists, and slayers of children. You know more than most what those simple people in the South face. They need Saxon wolves to stand up to the invader. The people need our own killers to protect them. You should be able to follow our trail for a few days, if you change your mind. We ride west to gather more men from my lands, and then we go south. Follow us, if you want to win back your thanehood. The riders wheeled their mounts around and thundered off, returning up the road from which they'd arrived. Beornoth stood for a while and watched them disappear into the distance, calm returning to the small village once more. Everything Athelhelm had said was true. The Saxon people would feel the pain of Viking savagery. If they were in the south to raid, then the long, sleek warships with their shallow drafts would sail up rivers deep into the heart of Essex, Wessex, Mercia, and East Anglia. They would strike fast, their goal to become wealthy and kill, burn, and cut a swathe of destruction across the country. Beornoth knew more than most the pain those farmers and peasants would face, and that they depended on the king and his network of king's thanes, and the thanes sworn to the elder man of the shires to bring their swords and shields to fight the Vikings. But Beornoth didn't carry a sword, and nor did he wear a beerny mail coat. Athelhelm had taken them away, those weapons of great value and prestige, and given them to another man. 
biting on a promise of a new Harriet was not enough. It was not enough for him to ride with arrogant, young, untested warriors like that golden-haired fool amongst Athelhelm's men. Beanoth imagined the pleasure in teaching that pup how to fight, rather than Athelhelm's bastard, hours of strength, training, and weapons drills, until he wept from the pain. Elderman Athelhelm's men were all well-armed and well-mounted, and Beanoth would go to war, carrying his rusting axe and old spear, and riding a nag too small for his hulking frame. They were the household troops of an elderman, and therefore ranked higher than a reeve. He might have fallen far, but Beanoth would be damned if he would take orders and allow himself to be mocked by a gaggle of snot-nosed bastards. Is there war? Are the dens returned? asked Chen Wolf, a cracking nervousness in his voice. There's always war. The Danes will always return, said Beanoth, his voice harsher than he intended. He turned his back on Chen Wolf and winced at a stabbing pain in the small of his back. Beanoth strode towards the tavern. He needed to get his wound dressed, but more importantly, he needed a drink. His belly was sour, churning and twisting around Athelhelm's offer. Kill some Norsemen, and the elderman would attempt to make good all that he had taken away. It sounded so simple. These new Vikings, fresh from their harsh northern homes, would be pagan Odin worshippers, men who longed to die a glorious death in battle, hungry men looking for silver and glory and to please their gods with blood. For them, war was their pathway to their heavenly hall in Valhalla. They fought prepared to die, craving glorious death in combat, death in battle being the only way of securing their place in the feasting halls of their gods. Beanoth had fought such men before, and it was no simple matter. The Danes in the Kingdom of York were mostly Christians, having lived in Britain for generations, where over time they had learned to follow the one true God. The Christian religion had softened them, 